Good morning. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, Miss Toma, uh, Pastor, and uh, every leaders and everyone. Good. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. This is a global event. Thank you very much for participating in today's event. I know other than our wonderful guests, we also have a lot of friends who are here either in person or online to participate, participate in this event. Now we're going to use Chinese to uh, host the event. For any of you who needs a Chinese interpretation, please use the interpretation uh, function there to choose the Chinese channel. Now, while we are live streaming, we're going to use Chinese interpretation. So this is the international dialogue. This is a, a global uh, climate change governance. We have the uh, C2G and then Tsinghua. We also this hosted by the uh, Tsinghua University, the TUSDG to host this event. Also it's co-hosted by the Carnegie C2G event. Let me introduce you to all the wonderful guests here. They are the uh, experts of the Toma, who is IPCC the uh, vice chair. The second one, she he is the Dirk Messner. He is the president of the German Environmental Agency. And also we have Czech, Nidal Silla. He's the director of ministerial cabinet for environmental sustainable. We also, have Wang Jing. He is also the our our China's twenty uh, first uh, agenda. We also have uh, Jo Tindo. She is the uh, director of the OECD and Economic Cooperation. We also have Felix uh, Watil. He's the ambassador for the environment, uh, the head of uh, international affairs. We also have the senior research fellow, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, Xi Cheng Yin. We also have the um, executive director, Economic Climate Governance Initiative, Yanos Pasto. Uh, Tsinghua University here, we, our director and our industrial development and also our our uh, chair and also Tsinghua University, uh, Xelan. They are all part of our host today. Also the Tsinghua. Also our executive director. I am the executive director of the uh, Tsinghua University's, uh, the short is TUSDG. I am very much looking forward to uh, have a direct dialogue with all the experts today. According to the IPCC's most recent report, we all know, even though all countries are working very hard to take the steps to try to mitigate the climate change, but the overshoot is very possible. We need to take all measures possible to adapt to all the situations. In yesterday, the third Belt and Road uh, Summit, leaders all work with looking back to the uh, United Nations uh, development uh, goals and also United Nations agreement and also the Paris Agreement and also uh, Kunming Montreal's agreement. We all wanted to support and we wanted to make sure that we can work together. We want to make sure that human and nature can coexist in the meeting we need to take the uh, actions to cope with climate change. And also we need to have a, a equal principles to deal with this climate change situation. 
we need to work together to generate or create a new technology to move forward to a green world, so, such as uh, carbon capture and the SRM, such as these technology can help us to better realize a green, green environment, also to reach the goals. Hereby, I wanna talk about the uh, so solar radiation modification, what that could be. It is through a human method to change the, the albedo of the earth and to reflect some of the sunlight back to the uh, earth, back to the atmosphere. So the application of this technology is possible to solve the uh, global warming situation. However, right now, how this technology is effective in limiting the uh, global warming. And also the side effect of this technology is uh, quite unknown. We also need to know that today's event is also the Tsinghua University uh, and, and Carnegie, Carnegie Foundation's um, collaborative event, which is a series of events. So in this event, we also, our experts also have different discussions. Today, we're going to use the result of today's discussion, also invite all the experts to start more in-depth discussions. So right now, let's start with our uh, discussion. First, we're going to invite the uh, director, the uh, our uh, director of Tsinghua University, the uh, Xuelang uh, professor to give us a speech. Leaders, experts and uh, professors and teachers, good morning, good afternoon and good morning. I thank you very much for coming to this meeting while you're in the very busy. On behalf of the two uh, coordinated uh, organization, I want to say thank you. We are here to work together to deal with climate change situation. We hope that through this global dialogue and also multilateral collaboration, we can work together to cope with climate change. And all of the uh, crises causing by climate change are getting very frequent and severe. Also, we also are seeing more extreme weather is happening. And then we are seeing more extreme weathers and also the sea level rising. Global warming is affecting every corners of the world. Climate change situation is irrever irreversible. We are seeing civil rising and extreme weather uh, incidents are actually impacting or threatening our survival. Our global food, water, and um, uh, biodiversity, our uh, livelihood have been uh, threatened in the long term. According to the IPCC's most recent report, although every country is trying very hard to cope with the climate change situation, but in order to reach the one point degree rising limit, it is getting very difficult. This is going to cause a great impact and great in risk to our to human beings and the biodiversity. Also, in 2023s, the SDGs uh, has uh, during the SDG uh, summits and also the United Nations high level meetings. All nations have been uh, carefully assessed all the SDGs. Also, we're talking about a global crisis and all the economic has been impacted. And on top of that, we have COVID-19. So over the past uh, 10 years, we'll see that our progress has been going backwards. Therefore, in order to reach the goal of, that is set by the Paris Agreement, we all need to work together to invest more resources and also to come up with new technologies and to have more dialogues. We also have to have policies to work very hard to reverse the effect of climate change. In 2022, China have bring up uh, a very important goals in the United Nations meeting. 
we want to reach the peak by uh, the uh, mid, mid 20 before the uh, the end of the centuries. And also we wanted to make sure that we have our contributions. China has a set several strategies to uh, deal with climate change. We are working very hard to meet the goals of uh, carbon neutral and and also we continue to optimize our uh, our energy uh, portfolio. And also we are uh, looking into the carbon um, credit and also carbon markets. Although we're seeing, although the, the extreme weather situation have different effect on different countries. However, confronting with the issues of climate change is the responsibility of every country. Therefore, we need to continue to work together and then we need to have the idea of win-win so that we have to work together to work with all the countries together so that we need to make sure that the climate change uh, combating efforts can be uh, can see progress. We are working with all the experts today uh, to see that the result of a discussion can come up with a better discussion to come out this would be a way for us to come up with more uh, idea to have uh, about global governance of climate change and the new technology. I hope that our audience today, uh, you can uh, focus on this and thank you for focusing on this. And I, I wanna say at Tsinghua University and also in our uh, environmental governance uh, organization and thank you very much and I hope this event could be very successful. Thank you, uh, Professor Shelan. And he carefully told us that his appreciation to all of our experts here today. So next, we're going to start our very first speech. We are very honored to uh, invite Thelma Cruz. She's going to give a speech she was the uh, vice uh, president of the IPCC. She's going talking about the potential effect of solar radiation modification. Now let's welcome Mr. Ms. Cruz. Yes, uh, good morning. Thank you very much, Dr. Zhu. And uh, also I would like to say good morning to all of our experts in this discussion and all those that are uh, hearing uh, this dialogue today. So let me at the onset th thank uh, the hosts of this meet, meeting, obviously, the Institute for Sustainable Development Goals at the Tsinghua uh, University and also C2G. First, for the initiative to promote this global dialogue on climate cooperation and governance, and also for inviting me to provide an introductory speech. So in this speech, I will address the issue of uh, risks from climate overshoot and the potential role of solar radiation modification in managing these risks. The basis for my presentation, it couldn't be different, is the findings of the reports from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, during the last sixth assessment report. I hope to contribute to set the scene for the panel discussion that will follow later in this dialogue. So of the emission scenarios that have been assessed by the IPCC to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels until the end of this century, some of these are referred to as having limited or no overshoot, whereas others are referred to as scenarios with higher overshoot. So defining overshoot, IPCC uh, defines in the glossary that uh, temperature overshoot is a temporary exceedance of a specified level of global warming, say 1.5 degrees Celsius, that then returns to that level or before or below before the end of a specified period, say the end of this century. The issue is that temperature overshoot substantially increases the risk of release to the atmosphere 
of the carbon stored in the biosphere due to increased wildfires, tree mortality, insect and pest outbreaks, peatland drying, and permafrost thaw, for instance. So in summary, if global warming transiently exceeds 1.5 degrees Celsius, then many human and natural systems may face additional severe risks compared to remaining below 1.5 degrees Celsius. So depending on the magnitude and duration of the overshoot, some impacts will cause the release of additional greenhouse gases, and some will be irreversible, even if global warming is reduced. So IPCC includes examples of regional key risks based on the magnitude of adverse consequences, such as perversiveness of the consequences, degree of change, irreversibility of consequences, and other factors. So additional warming above 1.5 degrees Celsius during an overshoot period this century, for instance, will result in irreversible impacts on certain ecosystems with low resilience, such as polar mountain and coastal ecosystems impacted by glacier melt or by accelerating sea level rise. Obviously, rapid, profound, and sustained emission reductions will increase the likelihood of limiting warming to the long-term temperature goals of the Paris Agreement. Nonetheless, researchers are investigating deliberate large-scale intervention options as potential supplements to deep mitigation, such as, for instance, in overshoot scenarios. In this context, solar radiation modification encompasses a suite of intervention options aiming at modifying the Earth's shortwave radiation budget and mask the climate effects of greenhouse gas emissions. So SRM options are not climate mitigation options since they do not address the root cause of the climate change problem, which is the increase of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Modeling studies have consistently shown that SRM has the potential to offset some effects of increasing greenhouse gas on global and regional climate, such as changes in extremes of temperature and precipitation, changes in the frequency of uh, tropical cyclones and intensity as well, and the melting of the Arctic sea, ice and mountain glaciers. One of the most researched SRM options, the stratospheric aerosol injection, could, for instance, limit warming to below 1.5 degrees Celsius. But the climate response to solar radiation modification interventions is uncertain, as already has been pointed out, and varies across the climate models. But by appropriately adjusting the amount, the latitude, altitude, and timing of the aerosol injection, modeling studies suggest that SAI, the stratospheric aerosol injection, is conceptually able to achieve some desirable combination of radiative forcing and climate response. But there is a large uncertainty in the stratospheric response to SAI and the change in the stratospheric dynamics and chemistry would depend on the amount, size, type, location, and timing of the injection. SRM has the potential to limit climate change impacts, even 
if atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations continue to increase. But the issue is that the potential implications of SRM on various dimensions of sustainable development are not yet well understood. There is low confidence in our understanding of the climate response to SRM, and the IPCC stresses that this is particularly so at regional scales. But there are also concerns about the implications of a sudden and sustainable ter termination of SRM, especially in high emission scenarios that could cause a rapid climate change, the risk of moral hazard, and the fear of a political pressure for a quick decision on SRM when the potential implications are still unclear. So thinking of these risks, why then might SRM be necessary? Well, in a risk-risk context, that is, judging the risks of application of SRM against the risks of climate change without the intervention, SRM could make sense in a world experience or expected to experience severe climate change impacts. This explains why considering the impacts of SRM in isolation may be misleading, as SRM's sole reason of being is the reduction or avoidance of climate impacts steaming from elevated greenhouse gas concentrations. Hence, the assessment of the potential effects from SRM needs to take into account a multitude of socially relevant parameters rather than a single one. So there is high agreement in the literature that for addressing climate change risks, SRM is at best a supplement to achieving sustained net zero or net negative CO2 emission levels globally. And also stresses that the co-evolution of SRM governance and research provides a chance for responsibly developing SRM technologies with broader public participation and political legitimacy, guarding against potential risks and harms relevant across a full range of scenarios. So I hope that with this, I have given a very broad, uh, a very broad uh, scenario from uh, some elements in the IPCC. Obviously, uh, there are benefits, but there are risks, many of them unknown. And especially because when you have a portfolio of options under SRM, some are mature, more mature than others. Some cost more, some cost less. But I, I would like to leave just a final note that also IPCC mentions that research is ongoing in SRM, uh, basically laboratory. And I see that China is possibly the only developing country that is carrying out or putting a lot of uh, investments in, in this research along with uh, other developed countries. It would be important in, uh, and this is you know, my view uh, personally, that we should engage more developing countries, because as I said, the risks of SRM deployment might have regional effects. And so everybody should know the effects and make a wise decision or informed decision if that comes to the table of the decision makers. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. And I hope that this uh, initial speech just uh, sets the scene for the discussion later on. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Thelma uh, Cruz, for your wonderful uh, speech. Uh, we talk about overshoot, uh, gave us some background information. 
and also uh, talk about the percent effect of uh, solar radiation modification. So next, we're going to invite uh, China is also working on this area. So next, we're going to invite the uh, Professor Wang Jin to uh, our speech. So he's going to share with us about the the technology that is set forth by in Paris Agreement. Uh, now let's welcome Wang Jin. Chinese so, um, Thelma uh, talked from the IPCC perspective, talk about some very important information. Um, additionally, you know, you are an old friend of mine, and I'm very happy to see you here. About 30 years ago, he came to uh, China to uh, discuss our China's Agenda 21, and at the time we talk about this uh, subject already, time sure flies. Um, right now, we are so happy to be able to talk about this topic again. And even though there are and a, I'm a here, lot of- I'm happy uh, to be here to share with some of the ideas with you. Mature, but I would like to share my ideas so with I everyone. So I know that uh, Telma, you- us talk about uh, Krug, China is the only developing Krug nation that, that is doing uh, only, making such uh, efforts country that was working on the um, to help the developing country well, and is, actually uh, the work a very that we beginning, have done which is getting is, started uh, and then there's still a front end kind of, of the our initial work. step and uh, in this we so, have actually talked to quite a few experts So that's not quite appropriate anyways. So right now, this question from the IPCC's perspective, it is to mitigate and adjust as a as a, in addition to it. So I feel that we can really look into this. And from the meetings contents that I feel that we can, for the CCUS, I think we can spend some time to, uh, to introduce that. And for the uh, CCUS, So, we need to talk about when we actually going to need to use carbon capture. So, right now, based on our estimate, to reach the goal of two degrees Celsius or 1.5 degrees Celsius, we need to uh, think about what sort of um, energy we use. So right now we're thinking that uh, the, from 2015 to 2050, that we, uh, we need to stop, you know, not using some of the infrastructures. So right now, So under the current scenario, we need to reduce a 10.5 uh, billion tons per year. 
Right now, we have uh, we have DEC and CCUS, you know, are some of the technology we're using right now. And so the development is quite uh, fast. And this is something that is looks like they are more tangible. So uh, in the globally, we're seeing uh, several different CCUS projects. We have about uh, 233 uh, large scale CCUS. And uh, actually, uh, some of them are actually in operation. The good news is that in the past, we the we're using the uh, low hanging fruit when to do the uh, carbon capture, like in the oil and gas. Right now, you can see by 2020 to 2030. And within the next 10 years, the trend is that we are moving towards uh, the more challenging area. So this is actually a good uh, way to look at these things. Of course, we all care very much about what China is doing. By uh, 2020, uh, we make the promise at the United Nations about carbon neutral. So this is the beginning of our 14th five years plan. By uh, after 2020, we wanted to include CCUS into our five year plan. And then we have something like we want to capture about like billions of tons of uh, carbon. And these are very important goals for China. Also, we have some quantitative uh, numbers to show you here. So right now, we have about, uh, look, at, look at the number here. Uh, this is by uh, millions of tons here. Uh, so from the current to the recent, which is A5 here, we want to use a CCUS to uh, capture more of the carbon. And over towards the end here, we have T1, T2, and T3. Uh, in the next few years, and CCUS are going to play an even a bigger role in contributing uh, to reduce the carbon emissions. So in working in the science technology department, we are actually working, working very hard in different projects. Here you can see we are working in different area. We can use the capture. We can uh, use the uh, integrated optimization. And you see the part with the stars marking next to them. These are the, some of the very important areas. And also they are the uh, places, the areas that we need to capture, uh, we need to catch on. Next, let's talk about uh, risk management. This is my from my personal perspective. Let me share with you my ideas. Now, when we talk about the uh, CCUS, we can uh, see it from you know the storage in an other area. However, CCUS and CCR and SRM and the solar radiation modification, they all have different uh, pros and cons. And of course, we regard IPCC report, IPCC report uh, very highly. In certain area, we have different idea compared to IPCC report. So I have been to many different uh, meetings, could be the United States or in other places. Uh, we talk about carbon management. So based on this, we hopefully we can use this concept to uh, talk about how we're going to uh, manage the carbon emissions. Of course, this is challenging. No matter what you can see, when we talk about the CCUS, other than that, we can use CDR and that will become a um, carbon management. I think this is actually useful to think of it that way. Now let's talk about S. If we use that idea as a backdrop to talk about as uh, SRM, then I think that could be complementary to each other, and I think that would be a good logic, a good framework for us to talk about these things. Therefore, um, right now we need to think about these things. 
In the past, from CCUS to carbon management, um, also when you think, think about the risk, uh, like uh, Ms. Telma talked about this, right? SRM itself are going to have its own risk as well. Some people think that if you use the uh, CDR, uh, that will not be able to solve the problem then what that would be the only option left because then the only option left would be to use SRM. Of course, the, this might not be the best way to do this. However, this is the, our earth and we are facing this uh, big challenge. And then China will use in Chinese herbal medicine and the Western countries using Western medicine. And if we are using both the Chinese medicine and the combined with the Western medicine, we still cannot cure this disease, then I think this is a big problem we're facing right now. Perhaps we need to uh, find some kind of psychology or somebody who has the magical power to uh, cure this illness, um, to also also, we can look at this from the uh, you know, geoengineering perspective to look at this thing. This is something maybe we can encourage the scientists to do. So now let's look at this from China's perspective. Of course, indeed, we uh, have some concept about this. Now, this talk about uh, solar, the aerosol injection. This is something that we can see and maybe we can actually experiment, maybe. So for a developing nation, developing nation also needs to participate in the dialogue in these uh, kind of uh, technology. Also that in China, we have a lot of, with the government uh, putting a lot of funding to help assist with this kind of uh, technology research. So, so what's interesting about this is that we found out that our work is still just, it just has just begun. And then we also need to have a lot of experts to participate in this. And also we need to revolutionize in the way we do this research. And we also have a better criteria to do this research. Uh, in terms of SRM, we, we talk about its risk and its discoveries. I'm not gonna go into the details about this, but I think you know this better than I do. Of course, you know, when you look at this, uh, there is a conundrum right here. Although SRM might be able to uh, be the last option to help us, you know, uh, relieve the uh, uh, global warming, However, it might bring in new problems here. What are we gonna do with that? Let's say you take this uh, pill, it solves the symptoms. However, it created another problem for to your body with the side effects that comes from this medication. So how are we gonna deal with the next symptoms? I think that we need to find a balance that will be better. Lastly, let's talk about the three important elements here because uh, we have now started as SRM. So let's talk about CCUS. Then let's talk about the technology technology itself. Um, most of these technology have, are not quite mature yet. And we also do not have a good combination of what technologies to use here. In fact, China, we have a one plus N uh, system. So when it comes to one is from our uh, government and however, it still needs a lot of uh, more information. Let's talk about CCUS. We need to be more targeted. We need to have more restraint and we need to have more incentives. So let's say SRM, right? It has risks. And a lot of there has, a, it has a lot of uncertainties as well. And then also, we talk about carbon capture and the cost is still quite high. 
So we also need to have the uh, the policy and all the different elements combined together so that we can commercialize this to incentivize people to do this. And then when we talk about SRM, we also need to have the technology. However, is not people have not been focused on this very much. Uh, when it comes to policy, we still need to uh, continue to promote this internationally. We some in some it's, it's quite controversial in some places that say in in uh, Swiss, Switzerland we have the uh, global environmental uh, meeting we talk in, in the UNEP we talk about this and and UNEA we also talk about this we also uh, uh, the United States also have a research and they also have the framework as well. And when we talk about market, uh, I know that in the United States, we have some um, company, is the company called Make Sunsets. They already started to sell the, uh, sell this cooling credits. So um, by using SRM, they are starting to sell the effect of uh, cooling. So we'll talk, therefore, the, the next step we should do, I mean, to China, I think there are a few questions we need to answer. Do we really need to strengthen our basic knowledge of SRM? And also, do we need to have more research uh, researchers to do this? And another thing is, is it really necessary for us to uh, increase our science activities? Lastly, do we really need to strengthen the international collaboration? So we would like to uh, uh, have more communication with all the experts here and economic cooperation as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Huang Jing, for to give this this wonderful uh, speech. I know that SRM and CCU SRM is a very uh, pion is a pioneering pioneering technology. And I know the CCUS um, is very important as well. I know the SRM is very much a uh, new technology. And to some people, it's almost like a sci-fi technology. Even so, uh, we need to continue uh, to improve our knowledge and the understanding of this technology. And also, we need to understand how we to how to better govern this kind of technology. And there are certain challenges we need to uh, determine what it can be. And we also need to assess these technologies. And so we can better utilize these technology. Next, let's uh, have a round table discussion here. Uh, the next one will be, let's use uh, Janos uh, Pasto, uh, the executive director of Carnegie Foundation. Uh, to be the, our moderator. Uh, we're going to have a different uh, panelist here. The, uh, we have uh, Director Nesta. Also, uh, we also Sela from o OECD and also Wetter, the ambassador, also a Director Cheng Yin. Now let's welcome our uh, experts to uh, wonderful guests to turn on your camera. We also uh, welcome all of our, our guests here watching online, uh, bring up your questions. Uh, our workers will be working in the background to collect all of your questions. The next step will be going through the questioning to ask our expert to answer the questions. Okay, well, thank you very much, and uh, uh, thank you for your words, and thank you for the, the two keynotes. Uh, I think what we heard from there are some very useful elements for our discussion already. Uh, managing uh, uh, toward a low-carbon or zero-carbon world is challenging. It's difficult. It can be done. It can be done, but it is difficult. And uh, to use Huang Jing's word, there, there is no magic solution out there. We have to work hard. Now, uh, the bottom line is that we need to, uh, all this is mainly because of the consumption of an emissions from fossil fuels, and the world needs uh, in, in a sort of absolute priority 
transformative substantial emission reductions, uh, maybe supplemented by carbon capture and storage, or also uh, removal of excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and of course, adaptation to contribute to alleviate the impacts of the warming that is already committed. The challenge that we face is that even according to the IPCC reports, all of the above, even if we do everything intensively, may not be enough. And the world may need to rely on additional temporary emergency measures such as SRM. We don't know if it will. It's only a question of may at this point. But then the questions arise, uh, given the climate crisis, should we use or not? Uh, stratospheric aerosol injection in particular? Should we research it or not? Or should we even talk about it? These are the questions that many people uh, address, and I think some of our panelists will address these questions uh, one way or another. Uh, C2G, uh, throughout the seven years of our existence, we have made sure that we remained impartial about whether or not these technologies should be used, but we were not impartial about the need to discuss these issues and bring these issues to the attention of governments and also non-state actors. Now, but there is another issue. It's not just the, the climate crisis. Of course, it's in the context of the overshoot that we're talking about these issues, but there is also the risk related to the lack of governance. And that's also the IPCC was very clear about that. The, the risk of the lack of governance is a risk by itself. It can lead to unilateral actions and all kinds of other issues. So, uh, and, and uh, we, we don't have the robust uh, comprehensive framework at the intergovernmental level to handle this. Neither do we have in place the kind of governance that is needed for societal engagements and discussions about these complicated issues. So uh, the objectives of this panel discussion will be to explore how can one approach these governance gaps and do that from different perspectives. Uh, we have uh, uh, an excellent panel with us, and uh, uh, maybe i just share a few words about how I imagine these next uh, well, 45 minutes now, because we want to make sure that there is time left for question and answers. So I will ask the panelists to uh, first to introduce themselves, not just to say who they are and where they work, but also uh, what is it that interests them in engaging on discussions about solar radiation modification, what is of interest, what is of concern, and so on, about a minute each. Then I will ask each panelist a question, an initial question, which I hope they can address in about three minutes. They will all be similar, but maybe with a slightly different twist, uh, but uh, uh, I hope that they can address uh, these initial questions in a couple of minutes. And then I hope that there will be some exchange between the panelists themselves. I would certainly encourage the panelists to ask each other questions and maybe follow up with a comment or uh, an alternative perspective uh, uh, on those issues. Uh, and if needed, uh, depending on how discussions go, I will also come in uh, with a question or two. And then I will hand back to uh, uh, our chair uh, for uh, managing a question and answer session with the participants. I understand we have a very large number of participants following this session. That's great. So I hope that some interesting questions will come out of that. So we will. I I will definitely want to make sure that our panel discussion uh, leaves enough time for the question and answer session. So with that, let me stop talking and let me start asking uh, the panelists for their self-introduction. Maybe I could start with uh, Joe Tindall, if you could say a few words. Over to you. Sure. Thanks very much, uh, Janos. And, and uh, we're already off to a really fascinating start uh, with this uh, panel. Uh, so I'm uh, the Director of the Environment Directorate at the OECD, and that means my perspective on geoengineering technologies comes from a, a climate and environmental point of view. Um, and I think that uh, uh, one of the, the singular uh, advantages of the OECD is its cross-disciplinary approach. So even though I'm coming at it from uh, my perspective, I'm working very closely with other directorates within 
the organization, for example, uh, um, one dealing with science, technology and innovation, uh, a directorate dealing with governance issues that are relevant to what we're talking about here. Um, so we all know uh, from our work that uh, taking rapid transformative action on climate change uh, is uh, vital given the recent indisputable evidence that the planet is already approaching dangerous climate um, tipping points today. So I'll talk uh, um, when we come back to the, um, the key question about uh, um, uh, geoengineering, particularly SRM. Um, and the key point I want to use as my starting point in that discussion will be, as we already know, we are, are making progress towards net zero, but my God, it's way, way, way too slow. Uh, and uh, we have to focus our efforts on behavior change and innovation that are going to deliver warp speed emissions reductions. And that's very different from uh, relying on mopping up an ever worsening mess after the fact. I'll stop there and um, talk more later. And thank you very much. Uh, maybe I can go on to Dirk Messner, please. Yeah, good morning and good afternoon to all of you. My name is Dirk Messner. I'm the president of the German Environment Agency and therefore I'm coming from the environmental perspective. Obviously, my agency is responsible for climate protection policies and obviously the overshooting discussion. Janos, we had a debate on this recently in Beijing is high on the agenda also in our discussions, right? And therefore negative emissions is something we are looking into currently. So CCS questions, CCU questions, carbon dioxide removal issues. And we are also looking at SRM. I'm talking about this a bit later and how I, I, I look at it and how I balance the risks. But we are looking at all these different options because we are in it, as Joe, as you have been mentioning, we are really in a challenging and critical situation. Maybe one last ses session because we are here in a group of people where China plays an important role. I'm also co-chairing the Track 2 dialogue with China. So it's a Chinese German Track 2 dialogue between experts on energy and climate. And in this context, I'm listening very carefully how my Chinese colleagues are looking at that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sheikh Sila, are you there? I, I don't see your picture, but I, yes, you're there. Perfect. <laughs> Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good uh, afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm Sheikh uh, Njai Silla uh, from Senegal. I used to be director of environment and uh, uh, senior uh, advisor to the prime minister of Senegal and uh, head of staff, staff in the uh, uh, ministry of environment. But by now, expert uh, to uh, many area including uh, climate i started the negotiation on climate on uh, from the beginning 1990 uh, before the convention and uh, i follow also the vienna convention the montreal protocol and uh, uh, chemical related uh, uh, mes uh, I, you asked me to speak about the global south i i don't have the pretension to speak on the global house, but some African perspective as Africa is in the global south, maybe that can respond to some questions that uh, you may ask. Thank you very much. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. And uh, next, uh, I have uh, Chen Ying, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Chen Ying. I'm from China's um, social. I'm the executive director. Uh, from uh, 2011, I participated. 2015, I participated the uh, China's Long Tan Gold. So I have uh, researched the SRM governance from. 2022, I started participating in uh, UNESCO. And next is also called uh, Science, Technology and Ethics Committee. I joined the committee. And this committee recently uh, drafted something about uh, climate engineering ethics research paper. And later I would like to share with everyone the main point of this report. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And last but not least, uh, Felix Wertli, please. Thank you very much, Janosch, and uh, good afternoon, good morning to all of the colleagues. My name is Felix Wertli, and I'm the Ambassador for the Environment in Switzerland. I'm heading the International Affairs Division here, and I'm also the head of delegation for the climate change negotiations. Um, perhaps two points at the outset of this, for sure, uh, I'm here as a government official, so I represent a sign of a policymaker's view, a government's view, and I think what we have heard already those introductory remarks about the context, those the findings of the IPCC, for us it's clear that we should look at this topic, we should not shy away from a discussion, we need more information about that, and for sure that's always in the context that we have to focus total mitigation, we have to do much more mitigation and discussing SRM to enable us to access information should never be an excuse to reduce any efforts on the mitigation side. I think that's really clear that this is also as outset as a starting point. And when we talk about mitigation, we also talk about adaptation. I think the moral hazard often is related to the mitigation efforts. We now view it's also getting more and more involved in the adaptation field. So we have really to do all our efforts to strengthen work on mitigation and adaptation, even if we collect information on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then with that, let's go uh, into the substance. And I, I'd like to follow the same order for now. Uh, uh, Joe, if we could start with you and if you could share with us a few thoughts, <coughs> sorry, a few thoughts about what do you see are the major gaps uh, for the governance of solar radiation modification? Uh, thanks very much, uh, Janosch, and I uh, appreciate getting the, the, the floor back again. Uh, to pick up where I left off, um, I, I think that uh, I really want to uh, agree with the speakers who have come before me uh, that uh, um, geoengineering technologies shouldn't be our, our line of first resort. Uh, and that applies equally to uh, um, CCUS, which does seem likely to be an important part of the toolkit. Uh, but uh, as it is uh, applied, it really shouldn't prolong uh, a dependency on fossil fuels. Um, I heard someone describe uh, geoengineering as, as a, a, a kind of, should come with a, a warning notice, break glass in case of emergency. They can and will uh, play a role in staying within that 1.5 degree guardrail that we're so close to, to breaking through, uh, and making sure uh, that if and when we do break through it, there is very limited uh, overshoot. But uh, technologies are more uncertain and potentially riskier, and that applies particularly to, to SRM. And there are associated scientific, ethical, and geopolitical risks. So just very quickly to, to pick up on that. The first key point is that there are lots of known unknowns uh, about these technology, but likely to be unknown unknowns as well. There's a significant knowledge gap uh, in their, their technolo these technologies, SRM in particular, with direct implications and impacts on governments, uh, governance. So our work, the OECD, uh, basically concludes that SRM technologies aren't yet a feasible policy option to manage uh, the dangerous impacts of climate change given that considerable risk associated with them and the limited research available to date. Uh, and in the, the further discussion, it might well be worth uh, um, exploring the implications of, of what China is currently doing in, in relation to, to research already. So those risks associated with uh, the deployment of SRM uh, today range from the doubtful... Sorry, uh, I think there's a... Translation coming through. Hopefully, it'll calm down now. Uh, the range from the the doubtful to the potentially terrifying, whether that's through altered temperature and precipitation patterns, acid rain, or changes in stratospheric ozone and surface radiation. And just to give one example of cloud seeding, for example, I mean it's being used already by some countries, and and it's not quite in the same league, but it's related. If it's used to increase pre precipitation in one locality or within one uh, country's national sovereignty 
territory, uh, that can have implications of reduced rainfall um, in neighbouring countries. So there are uh, governance and cross-territorial issues that, that have to be dealt with. More research is going to be necessary to understand the risks as well as our capabilities and increasing transdisciplinary research efforts to inform, inform climate change response strategies would be a really good place to start. So from my, our perspective, the efforts need to put transparency, justice, and I think Tilma already uh, um, touched on this, and broad engagement uh, as their uh, core to limit the risk of path dependency. And by that, I mean uh, an internal momentum to, to reach a particular result. Uh, and that path dependency would over rely on the deployment of SRM technologies. The second point is that bridges are gonna to have to be built among countries and between policy communities and research institutions to share progress and the results of different uh, research efforts into SRM technologies. The second major gap, uh, governance gap, is institutional. There's just not uh, the necessary national and international governance infrastructure uh, currently in place. We don't have a multilateral forum where any potential ge geopolitical tensions arising from research, let alone the deployment of SRM technologies can be addressed. Um, I think you asked a, a question at the outset. I don't think we can pretend or hope that geoengineering options won't be explored, whether by governments or, or private actors. So it is way better to be prepared and assume uh, that, uh, that they, they will be uh, um, on the horizon. More broadly, um, I think we live in a particularly challenging time uh, for international cooperation. Despite, and, and in part because of this, a multilateral forum where discussions on governments and regulatory frameworks for SRM can take place is, we think, essential. And conversations to raise awareness of these issues, just like the one we're having here today, are an essential step towards achieving that necessary governance framework. So in summary, geoengineering technologies will very likely be needed to supplement uh, other climate mitigation actions, but definitely shouldn't supplant them. More research is needed to better understand the risks as well as the opportunities that might uh, um, to be derived from them. And this must also be the foundation to filling the uh, uh, governance gaps that are, are pretty yawningly wide at the moment. Thanks, Jonas. Thank, thank you very much, Joe. And, and you've raised lots of important issues. My insights are burning with lots of questions, but I won't put any at the moment because we're a little bit behind at time. So let's leave that for now. And I would like to go to Dirk now and ask him how he sees the potential risks and benefits of SRM. And in that context, uh, how do you see possible routes to strengthen international governance frameworks around this emerging uh, or new technique? And how do you see the role of governments and non-state actors, uh, such as academia and civil society in that? So there's many questions, but I, I hope you can uh, try to address them briefly. Thank you. I will try to structure it a little bit, uh, Janos. So I think I can I can build very well on what Joe you just uh, already said. Now for me that the main toolbox is mitigation, deep and accelerated adaptation, next step, and we need it anyway. And carbon dioxide removal is something we need to invest in rapidly because overshooting issues are on the table, and staying below even two degrees global warming is very challenging. This is my first thought. Now my second thought is, and I'm starting with my conclusions already, and then coming through to bring the arguments why I'm coming to this conclusion. Looking at SRM, I would argue that we should avoid solar radiation management if possible, and we should not define it as a climate protection policy technology because it is not. And I support the discussion about governance and about global governance. And in this context, I'm arguing with a network of international scientists, a solar radiation non-use agreement. This is also a global governance arrangement because we have voices driving into this direction and we need rules and, and uh, standards for that. Joe, you mentioned this. Now, we are in a critical situation in which 
global cooperation is so so challenging and under pressure in many fields. So how how do we how do we find common standards in this field? I'm arguing for a social radiation management non-use agreement. So why is it, why so? And I have four main arguments which I would like to to bring to your minds. And the first one is that solar radiation management does not address the root causes of climate change. We all already heard this from different voices. I agree on that. I emphasize this. This, It's not helping to reduce the greenhouse gas em emissions. It's merely masking global greenhouse gas emissions and therefore stabilizing, and I'm agreeing on that, this, it's stabilizing global warming processes. No? But it is not bringing the global emissions down as the drivers of the whole process. My key argument is very similar to, Joe, what you said and what Thelma also mentioned. No? Uh, the main argument is, is that we don't know the uh, ecosystem-related impacts of solar radiation management. Those will be global because we are manu manipulating a global system if you move into this direction. And this is about high uncertainty, therefore high risk. It is about unknown uh, unknowns actually joe, joe you mentioned this no we don't know the we don't do not even know the unknowns it is about unknown unknowns which we are having in front of us and, uh, this is my uh, strongest argument my third point which i would like to make is that if we move into this direction if you would have a global decision to start an srm process internationally no I mean, this would not be a one-shot event. We needed to move forward with this technology forever because we are only masking the global warming process. If we would stop, we might trigger a global warming shock. Uh, and this is something which we need to have in mind. This is my third argument. And I've, my fourth argument is, of course, I'm listening that there are everyday louder voices arguing in favor of social solar radiation management because the overshoot is, is there, and we have to find solutions for that. And the impacts of global, global warming are severe. Therefore, many countries are asking for answers, right? My answer, as I said, is mitigation, adaptation, carbon dioxide removal. Carbon dioxide removal is looking at the root causes. No? The, the, the effort would be to, to bring carbon emissions out of the atmosphere. This is something which we can do. It's still very expensive, but it does not have the same risks impacts as solar radiation management from my perspective has. So if a group of country, countries would decide to move into this direction, and this is not a, a very expensive technology actually, no? it, it is about 10 billion a year or so to start a large scale event. This might result into, you talked, told, told it Joe, a geopolitical conflict situations, no? because there, there would emerge the question of who actually is legitimate to move into this direction, because what a group of countries then might do would have global impl implications. No? So geopolitical tensions, uh, conflicts between different interest groups, I would like to see this um, prevented. Therefore, my plea for solar radiation non-use agreement efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dirk. And uh, Again, the same story. I, I, I will just move on uh, just to make sure we have enough time for discussion between the panelists. So uh, I would like to ask Sheikh Sila now to uh, look at uh, maybe from your perspective, what are some of the possible routes to strengthen international governance frameworks around SRM? Uh, and how do you see the role of, of uh, China, of African countries from your perspective in uh, uh, in this area. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, uh, Africa uh, is extremely concerned with SRM technology. And so we had the opportunity to develop a study in 2020 and two workshops for knowledge sharing in uh, 2022 for African perspective with regard to SRM. Africa is also a concern that the focus on negotiating a governance system for this emerging SRM technology will take time and potentially further divert political will and resources away from obligations to implement and finance proven policies, technology, and measures under the UNFCC framework. Africa also is further concerned that the SRM technology, in terms of current state of knowledge 
you have potentially severe transboundary impact and implication across military sectors and area of legal jurisdiction. Given the global and transboundary nature, it is important to be considered by relevant mandated bodies within the UN uh, system involving uh, the African Minister Conference on Environment at scientific, clinical, ethical, and legal level. While recognizing the importance of international control to prevent the uh, unilateral advancement of SRM technology, Africa is not yet, uh, I think, ready to support any engagement on possible broader international governance matters related to this technology, given the above mentioned, uh, mentioned limited level of understanding and considering that existing body within the UN system have the mandate to address any immediate geoengineering concern that may arise. And finally, the African group of negotiation on climate will want to develop further consideration and report to the African Ministerial Conference of uh, uh, Negotiation for decision making. And in light of this concern and high degrees of uncertainty around this technology, and uh, notably the SRM, Africa should not support their application at this stage, but should rather support the development of an authoritative scientific synthesis and review of the state of knowledge of the technology. The scientific assessment should be conducted by a mandated body such as the IPC or any other entity as UNESCO and other, or together as a scientific and technical uh, committee. But we need a broad participation uh, with the research, the civil society, the stakeholders. As we know that the SRM have impact on mitigation and adaptation, and mainly on adaptation. And uh, this one also involves geopolitical uh, 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 maybe problem to be uh, tackled later on. And uh, for that, uh, I stop here. And I'm sorry to not uh, be possible to continue this meeting with you because I have to close the African negotiation on uh, plastic, preparing the ice, the ink tree in Nairobi uh, in, in November. I'm sorry to leave the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Sheikh. And, and we, of course, understand uh, uh, that there are so many other processes going on. Uh, so. Uh, Thank you for your your uh, words, and we will maybe look at that uh, together with the other panelists in the discussion. And uh, uh, then I'll, I will uh, move on to the next uh, speaker. And and you leave when you have to leave. Thank you so much for participating. Uh, and uh, now I I come to Felix Wertli. If you could share with us. Uh, oh no, sorry. Uh, first, I wanted to ask uh, uh, Chen Ying to to. Uh, uh, share with us a few thoughts about the uh, key conclusions of that re UNESCO report that you were involved in, because I think that would be helpful uh, for this discussion. Uh, but also, if uh, partly also because of what uh, Joe asked, uh, maybe you could say a few words about the status of research and discussions of this issue in China. A bit more uh, words than Wang Jing uh, raised this also in his presentation, but just a little more detail. On what's going on. Thank you. So over to you. Uh, thank you, Janos. Early on, people brought up very valid points. They were very interesting. There are a lot of uh, problems, uh, questions that we don't yet have answers yet. However, discussion will uh, better increase our understanding of each other. There are, let me clarify two questions. One's from John talk about area that you talk about. In if one area uh, increased precipitation, the other place is going to reduce the uh, rainfall. If you use, uh, if you use, use weather modification, this is different from today's SRM. So it is not the same concept as what we talk about this SRM in China. Uh, we have done a lot of uh, 
research how we can uh, do significant uh, to reduce the damage of hail. So in the um, altitude of uh, like of 3,000 meters to uh, do some scales of the um, adjust, but that is uh, very different from the uh, technology that we are discussing right now. So this is one thing that I would like to clarify. Secondly, SRM indeed had a huge uh, risk and uncertainty. However, we cannot just um, blame about the risk because doing it, there are some risks and not doing it, there are some risks as well. So uh, right now the temperature has continued to increase. So like this past July has already um, globally, we can see the temperature is much higher, already exceed the 1.5 degrees Celsius. So we estimate going forward, this trend will continue and we're going to see more and more disasters, catastrophes, and the ice melting. So if we take actions, there are some risks. And not doing it in action, there's also risks. So we're in a dilemma. And we have to decide between the two, balance the two. So earlier I mentioned that in the UNESCO, under the UNESCO, currently there is a, a great greater focus on the SRM and we use the climate engineering, which is similar to geoengineering and it includes a CDR, SRM. And back in 2010, UNESCO, under UNESCO, there was a committee published about the ocean fertilization report. And in 2017, UNESCO also published a report about climate change, climate change ethics principles declaration. So, and I also participated in the um, ethical principles. So I involved in this, and then um, wrote a report about ethics. And in this report, indeed, there are a lot of uh, dis debates. A lot of authors has also different uh, opinions. And so at that time, should we just focus on uh, CDR or also include SRM? But eventually we include both. So essentially this in mature technologies with a high risk and high uncertainty um, and to get with the ethics issues that come along with it, um, especially the ethics and slippery slope issues. And there are lots of uh, disputes and we want to um, a human uh, centered or you want to have ecology centered. And our current generation, whether we have the responsibility for our next generation to maintain and protect the uh, earth from harm. And also there's the variation and the risk because a lot of policy had um, impacts for the humankind, there are some variations. So some group of people will sustain harm and some part of the uh, earth, there are some people they will receive benefits. So when we look at um, all those issues from the perspective of ethics, then we have to really consider that. In the report, it suggests, first of all, you have to start an open and collaborative, responsible cooperation. And we should take all the different kind of actions, including CDR, SRM. And SRM, we also distinguish different levels. Right now, nobody dare to say that it's 
support a big range implementation. However, for SRM's scientific research, generally, we support that we should conduct a necessary exploration. We have to understand the impacts in the back potentially. So I think it should be the last resort. It's a strong medicine. There are risks. However, it could be the approach that can be the first approach to reduce the, the, the warming. And of course, the UNESCO report also indicated the scientific research focus on the education and and there is a communication between the uh, society and the and the science and i think unesco should have taken the responsibility to work on this uh, job and i i don't know if i still have opportunity to talk later on i would like to uh, talk about uh, china's recent uh, released uh, the technology in terms of uh, ethics and i will continue later thank you uh, uh and and we are indeed running a little bit late uh i see joe you have your hand up can this wait until after uh, Felix uh, speaks, or do you want to quickly follow up on something now? Um, yes, super quickly. I wanted to respond to the, the comment about I had made uh, about cloud seeding, and I recognize it is not the same uh, at all as, as uh, SRM. The point I was making uh, was about transboundary consequences of techniques. Um, that uh, may also be relevant to, to SRM. So if any ex approaches to experimentation have to bear that in mind. And it also um, underscores the need for multilateral engagement before we're heading down uh, the track towards any so-called last resort uh, technologies. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Uh, and now I'd like to come to Felix. Felix Wertley, please uh, share with us uh, your thoughts about what you see as the major gaps for the governance of SRM. What are the possible routes to strengthen international governance frameworks around this technology? And how do you see the role of China, Switzerland, and maybe other countries in moving this forward? Over to you. Thank you. And a very interesting discussion so far. Um... I think one key element is, now if you want to talk about governance, have an enabled discussion, I think first of all, we need a level playing field of information. I think that's a basic problem that we have, that not all governments, not all key actors, not all stakeholders have the same information. For me, that is a question of fairness, that all have, first of all, do we have the information that we need? We have talked about the, the unknown of the unknown, and also that, First of all, do we have the information that we need? And secondly, do we have access to this information? And for sure, there's also what I was mentioned before, the question of the global south, small island states and so on, do they have the access they need? When we talk about science or information at this stage, I think there are some basic elements that we should be informed about. And that is for sure the state of science. What do we know? Perhaps what don't we know yet? It is the risk and benefits. Transboundary uh, uh, impacts have been mentioned as an example, but much more is adverse effects on the environment, on the, the, the food security and so on, that we should know about that. We've also heard some activities are ongoing, but also we have heard some governance frameworks exist, so the mapping of the existing governance frameworks, and also information of what kind of activities, projects, perhaps big actors are involved at this stage. Important also when we talk about governance frameworks, we'll be interested to have know more about national, regional, and international existing ones. There was also the question, would it be important to have kind of a regular update of information of what is going on, so kind of a monitoring of those activities to inform uh, decision makers, policy makers about that. Um, another important point was also for sure that the status of research is the, what kind of research is going on. I think we have heard, we see it's still at the quite a low level, but it's also increasing, more actors are getting involved. And in case there would be testings, it would be very much important to that people are informed about testing activities. Um, 
Also to relate what Dirk Messner has mentioned, no, you advocated for non-use agreement. My understanding is if you want to have an enabled discussion, that's always the basis to have access to information. So if the idea is to discuss a non-use agreement, if the idea is to prevent unilateral use, is just the idea to discuss what kind of research is needed, how to frame this research, perhaps for control, testing, and so on. Access to information for policy makes always the first step. And to my understanding, we don't have this access to information yet. We are lacking that. We have a number of reports now published, but we don't have this kind of comprehensive report. And one question could be, um, which, uh, which are the four of us to, to have such kind of a report? No, and I think that UNEP for sure could play a particular role. The United Nations Environment Program, there you have UNEA, so you have a body there, you have universal membership. That means countries from the global south, global north, all the types of countries are present there. UNEP has experienced in doing assessment, so collecting information that exists, so not establish basic science, but bring together existing knowledge. And they have methodologies how to enable access to information. So one element could be that we think about, should there be a mandate, for example, for UNEP, in what form ever, to provide this kind of assessment of information that decision makers, policy makers, important actors, stakeholders have the same level of knowledge to then also discuss further and have a good discussion about that. I think I forgot to say at the very beginning, I apologize for that. I only, when I talk here, I talk only about SRM. I think others like Dirk, um, like, like them, both explain the differences. For sure, CDR is also an important toolbox. We have to look at it. There are also questions around some of the tools we will use to, 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 to mitigate and to, to fight climate change. But I think there's also a good distinction between both of them. And that's why I, I did now here only focus on SRM. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Felix. And uh, uh, we have just a few minutes uh, before we need to hand this over for the Q&A uh, session. Uh, so uh, for, first of all, thank you, Felix, for identifying a very basic part of governance, which is uh, to have information and to have access to that information in a way that is fair and everybody uh, is able to access that. So that, that's an important practical step uh, that, that you suggested here. Uh, if you do, you, you already referred in some cases to each other, but if you have any particular question or comment on what some of the other panelists said, please raise it now. We have maybe about five minutes where we could have a quick exchange uh, between uh, you. And that includes also uh, uh, Telma and Huang Jing, if, if you're still there, uh, please uh, 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 just uh, feel free to, to, to react to what, what you've heard from each other. So uh, uh, I see Dirk's hand already, so please. Uh, Thank you, Janosch. I wanted to mention one point. I mean, there is a overarching consensus on the uncertainty issues. All of us mentioned this, no? And the second point which we have been debated, uh, debating during the last hour or so is, well, how can science help us? Thelma, you also mentioned this. What do we know and what can we know? And I mean, the challenge here is that with the, with the method methodologies we have, to do research on the impacts of SRM globally and locally are limited. So this will not, in the, in the current situation which we are with the methods with which we are, we cannot answer the impact questions with our modeling exercises. Uh, this is the current state of the art. No? The second observation then is local experiments would not help us to understand global impacts. And short-term experiences would not help us to understand long-term in SRM initiatives. You know? So therefore our, our possibilities to solve the knowledge questions are not at all easy to answer. You know? And therefore for me, the uncertainty issue and the limited possibilities to manage or to solve the knowledge problems, these two uh, points have been, have been uh, brought, brought together and my conclusion out of that is then that I'm so skeptical as I expressed already. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any, uh, Thelma, please. Yes, th thanks, Janos. And Felix, I, I do 
I do share all the concerns that I have put forward. And I'm, I'm speaking as Thelma, not as, you know, um, former IPCC vice chair, which gives me a lot of uh, degrees of freedom, you know, to express my own thoughts every time we had, uh, you know, uh, C2G events, I would say, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm bounded to refrain myself from comments because of my role as as IPCC vice chair. So I, I do share that with you, but I'm not so skeptical, um, Felix, in the sense that I personally think that it's not fair that there are ongoing efforts on modeling, despite the fact that these modelings might not provide the full answers to everything, they might partially provide some responses to some of the enormous number of concerns that we have, but it's already an advance. What I think is not fair is the, uh, it's the uneven participation in the research efforts. If I take Brazil, you know, Brazil is leading many things, but Brazil has nothing, you know, no efforts in SRM at all. We do see in South America an effort in Argentina, pity money. I mean, it's just one concentrated effort in one single area of concern in SRM. So how could we uh, be fair and I don't think that uh, at this point, it would be feasible to say, we are not gonna do anything else anymore. So let's stop it. I don't think that there is, a, that there is no going back in my vision. And especially, if I may say, with my degree of freedom, that oil and gas you know, sector is absolutely interested in pursuing more and more on this uh, research theme for the reasons that I don't have to say. So um, in the terms, so, so I, I think that the, the, the governance of research is lacking. So I am pro research as I should be as, as, as a researcher my, myself, myself or used to be. So I am pro research in this area because I think we need to be prepared. As negotiator in the Climate Change Convention, we cannot, for instance, get caught into this discussion without being prepared as governments to respond to that. Mm -hmm. So I always say we need to be informed and information means science, evidence-based. So in that respect, I, despite the fact that the modeling is not gonna answer everything, it might partially give the governments and other stakeholders with some idea of what, what to expect. My main concern, Felix, is really uh, what Joe has mentioned, you know, the transboundary effects of the implementation, which we normally do not say small scale, we say large scale uh, implementation, because else it's not gonna, you know, uh, work. It might work normally with having, having transboundary effect. Uh, my fear is that some of the regional effects, which are not going to be then, as I said, equally distributed, might affect the areas which are most vulnerable, most vulnerable to changes in uh, precipitation pattern. And I mentioned more specifically Africa. So with all the problems, then if you have this, plus an impact from SRM large scale deployment on less precipitation that will affect agriculture, that will affect the more their economy. So, you know, these are huge issues of uh, when we talk about justice, fairness, mm -hmm. equity. I just want to go beyond, you know, words mm -hmm. and effectively think of the implications of these very strong wording in practice. Thank you, Thelma, and thank you for your increased freedom of, uh, <laughs> of being able to address these issues. Okay. I see Felix's hand, so please. <laughs> thank you much. Thank you, Thelma, for the remark. I don't know if there was a misunderstanding. 
I am not, I didn't speak against research. I think we need more research. And I think also this idea of a governance of research is important. What I talk about is about access to information. I think there we have a problem. You are a researcher, you have very much access to information. Many governments, depending on the structure, the resources they have, they might not have to the, the access to the knowledge. We have seen that we have submitted 2019 a resolution at UNEA. It was mentioned in one of the presentations. Many government representatives were surprised about this topic. They were not informed about the topic. And that is a problem. And then we talk about access to information. What we think is that we need somehow to collect existing information, including status of, of science and so on, perhaps needs for further research. And then government representatives, policy makers should be informed about that. So we are not against the research. I think the idea of uh, governance of research is very interesting, but what is lacking at the moment is a structure how we can inform policy makers, government stakeholders about what is happening in this field. Thank you, Felix. And before handing back to our chair, I, I would just like to ask, uh, uh, Chen Ying, if you could just say a minute about that paper that you wanted to talk about, uh, the one that was prepared in China, I think that could be helpful for this discussion. So please. Let me quickly uh, give you another additional information. Right now, we don't have enough uh, policy for governance. We don't have international law to regulate the uh, usage of uh, SRM. I think uh, domestically in China, we uh, our policy and uh, is really uh, important. We need to have the policy. Additionally, in China, we have a uh, technology uh, a concept that is in the next round of technological uh, revolution. We need to uh, talk about techno technological advancement. So it's like two uh, headed uh, arrows that can uh, bring us the benefits as well as new risks. So we need to have uh, talk about ethical uh, problem when it comes to technology. Right now, China is already focused in this, focusing in this area. In March of 2020, China has a, a topic that is about a topic about the governance of te technology. And it talk about uh, the science and technology. We need to have a way to control its risks and also need to carefully dealing with these uncertainties, especially, and it may, it may uh, threaten the safety of our social society and uh, civil society as, as well as the ecosystem. We need to look at this uh, very uh, seriously. Uh, in a few days ago, that is in October uh, 8th of 2023, Department of Science and Technology, along with other departments, we issue a uh, science technology uh, audit uh, documents. The goal is to build uh, the ethical uh, assessment mechanism to assess our science te technology. So amongst it, there's one, one topic talk about it the in it the, if it does not directly contact human and animals however uh when it comes to uh the sustainable development of our our human beings and also bring in the ethical uh risk uh, activity like that if it's going to threaten our ethical uh, problem we need to do an audit in this area so the chinese government is trying to build a mechanism to deal with a certain technological activity that uh, are that is actually controversial, and I think in regard regarding uh, technology like SRM, this actually applicable. Uh, they can be used in China, and 
because they can consider as a controversial activity. And if it's, that's the case, we need to have a way to regulate that. And also, we need also to strengthen this before the international uh, system is in place. And we need to go through our Chinese uh, governmental uh, regulation to start to regulate this. Thank you very much, Xie. And I see uh, you have your hand up. If you have a quick uh, follow-up point, and then I need to give the microphone back to our chair. So, yes, of course, and and, and really just to um, uh, suggest that uh, we should approach this question of governance from the point of view of prevention of harm rather than uh, uh, kind of from the, the point of view of having a firm intention to use or, re or even more rely on geoengineering um, technologies. Um, so that should underpin uh, the collaboration uh, that's going to be essential to strengthening international governance uh, around SRM. Uh, and collaboration uh, is, uh, um, you know, a good place to start is uh, in research. And just to re-emphasize what I said earlier, uh, and to, to kind of place it in that context of harm prevention, research collaboration should be based on pr principles of transparency, of justice, and of broad engagement to limit that risk of path dependency uh, on the, the deployment of SRM. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank the panelists for a very interesting discussion. And now I'd like to hand the microphone back to uh, Chu Shu Fang, uh, and please, uh, uh, you can facilitate the question and answer session. Uh, I believe we have a few questions uh, for uh, our speakers. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, for all the panelists for your wonderful discussion. Let me share a number with you to tonight, right now. We have over 8,000 people are watching this uh, uh, webinar online. So this is a very successful event. This is if we are in a physical uh, uh, auditorium, this will be uh, will not fit all the people in there. So let's start uh, to answer the questions. Uh, we uh, actually collected some questions. Now uh, let's, let's talk about uh, uh, let's, uh, we invite all the uh, roundtable experts to uh, talk, answer questions. Uh, all the questions were coming in English. So uh, if the questions are uh, uh, placed in, in English and I'll ask them in English, if it's in Chinese, I'll ask in Chinese. First uh, comment and the question is from uh, 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 Klaus uh, Radinsky. Radinsky. Uh, the question is, before implementing SRM, it might be an option to broaden the scope of less risky activities, which might be based upon a radiative forcing management. ISO has started some work on this option already in 2018 and might publish some technical papers on this option next year. Uh, regarding this comment, comment, do our guests have any uh, latest uh, update to respond? So I want to uh, briefly make a statement. So it was mentioned about smaller risks, but also about radiation management technology. And as a matter of fact, SRA includes a lot of technologies, and I feel the most con controversial one is the stratospheric um, aerosol injection. And in SRM, there are also some uh, uh, some technologies with a less uh, risk. So, for example, yeah, brush uh, paint the white uh, paint on the roof. Um, even though they have a smaller risk, but then they have much less effects. So, I think we shouldn't um, 
of course, we don't want to uh, take a huge risk. But, you know, for those smaller risks approaches, they won't be sufficient in a grand scale, scale globally. So I think you should think about that uh, from this perspective as well. Just to, to stimulate the discussions. Yes, I thank you very much, Enwing, for, for your comments. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, when we talked about SRM, we were talking about a portfolio of options. And I think that we singularized uh, one because it's the most studied, which is the stratospheric uh, aerosol injection. And uh, because we have more studies on this one, we know more uh, the potential implications of, uh, of a potential deployment. Um, so uh, I think, uh, Janos, when C2G closed the you know, business, after seven years, I would say, uh, there is a very nice report that has been produced. And we see the evolution of the discussion on SRM uh, broadly. You know, you, if, if we look seven years ago and now we stand now, you see a huge uh, interest in getting to know more about it and investing into it. So um, I think that the, 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 the issue of uh, the other uh, the other options. Uh, obviously, the costs are different. The maturity of uh, these options are different. And also, not only that, but also the effect that these different options may have in terms of, uh, of uh, reducing the risks uh, of the impacts from higher temperature, for instance. So I think that, uh, you know, getting back to, I think IPCC has done a very nice job in putting together tables that shows exactly where do we stand in relation to these uh, to these different options in terms of maturity, cost, implications, including the implication uh, of what we 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 call um, uh, in, in that I mentioned, which is the termination effect. Some of these options do not have that determination effect, as AI does have that impact, depending uh, depending on. Uh, it's going to depend on a very long time of uh, being there as a technology, not only one year or two years. It's going to be a huge investment for many years and has to be global. So uh, I think that it is interesting from this point. Um, uh, our facilitator, if I could put a, 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 a question myself, what, what would be identified as? Oh, hold on. Part, yes, thank you. Uh, as, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, what are the barriers we see for a broader engagement of developing countries? Is it capacity building? And if it's capacity building, how do we break, you know, this lack of capacity? Where do we start? Is it financing? I think that financing is easier to overcome. So uh, what is seen, and I don't know if... Uh, uh, if Chen Wing could, uh, you know, give some perspectives in that respect, uh, in terms of what do you see as uh, preventing more developing countries to participate more actively in the research uh, in SRM, broadly speaking? Yeah, thank you for your question. I feel that as a developing countries, uh, research individual, and I think to be able to participate a globally, global governance discussion, the primary obstacle is the current research is extremely insufficient. So everybody feels that China has participated and started a lot of research. However, in China, it's still in the initial stage. So the only state government uh, project is from 2015 to 2019. And our uh, chief scientist is uh, an uh, Englishman, uh, John Moore, professor and participate participating are the uh, Zhejiang University and Chinese Science um, Academy. So I think 
for the uh, geoengineering issues, we have some initial understanding. And after the project uh, concluded, there is no other uh, country, no other uh, state su project support. So for SRM, um, uh, research was purely from my personal uh, interest and passion to continue to follow and track. However, there's no uh, project support. So in China, all the scholars that is concerning about this issue, actually only a handful. So insufficient research is is the main reason why we are unable to provide more insights or opinions about this topic. Um, so insufficient uh, research and also one of the reasons is the financial support, but also the, uh, the talents in this field is also another reason because a lot of people still think that this is a, a science fiction. They think they are far and distant However, I think the research should be imminent. It's urgent. And there are also other the uh, environment protectionists. They think that we should uh, start research because once you start the past, then you will continue to support. And then you're going to receive more funds for research and then more support will be garnered on this past. So we should not talk about this topic. We should not research on this topic. However, personally, I think it's a necessity. There is a need to continue to research. And I also support that there should be a fair, transparent participation, public participation. Also, scientists should have necessary communication with the general public. We shouldn't eat, we shouldn't uh, demonize it. We don't, we shouldn't have um, extreme fear, phobia or over uh, zealous or optimistic. You know, uh, the technology continue to progress and we need to have a look at it in a very dynamic and uh, fluid uh, attitude to address this complicated issue. Uh, thank you, Chen Ying, Professor. Um, I also, someone also raised hands. However, with the concern of the time, I think the later question we can combine with what we have before. Um, so let me introduce the next question. There are two issues and I think affect it has something to do with the impact, so I combine them. So in one hand, it's while well, the, uh, the global economy recovery, how do we look at the uh, SRM's uh, economic impact, and also was very complicated global situation that every uh, country's uh, actions about the climate action, how is it going to have impact geographically? So um, in summary, the individual's country's impact, how is it going to affect the geographic? I see if you look at the global economy and, and recession trends, which we see on the one hand side and geopolitical turbulences and wars around the globe on the other hand side, this obviously have impacts on mitigation activities because we are seeing that this is, is eroding in many countries and climate negotiations are becoming more, more challenging. I mean, we, we even don't know the impact of the Israel Palestine uh, conflict on next COP. So things are becoming much more difficult on the mitigation front for these reasons, right? This is the first trend which I'm seeing. The second trend which, trend which I'm seeing is something which, Joe, you mentioned several times. I mean, for, for managing and handling and developing good standards for any kind of looking at social, solar radiation management, cooperation is needed, no? And cooperation mm -hmm. currently is absolutely fragmented and bringing actors together and looking for joint solutions in this uh, turbulent situation is, is even more challenging. Therefore also 
getting global governance debates on solar radiation management, Janosch, we discussed this some weeks ago, no? is uh, as challenging and even more challenging as it is to come to good conclusions in the, mitig in the mitigation part. So this is the situation how I see it. You know, and this implies that we are in, in troubling waters in all these fields where global cooperation is needed for, Thelma, this was your point, for transboundary dynamics, which, which we have to cope by communicating and finding joint solutions, no? and uh, this is this is not the moment currently where which this is coming together nicely. But if you allow me, I would like to mention another issue which which uh, has been debated beforehand and comes back, Thelma, to your question of fairness and bringing the global south in. My quick answer would be capacity building and and huge funding, because if you look at research funds available for least developed countries, I mean near to zero, you know. And if these countries need to participate pay, 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 because impacts will be on their side, the hugest ones no? from, from global warming and also from solar radiation management. So this is number one. But then the, which research options do we have? And I see C3 no? and I would support strongly two ones. And the third one, we, we find ourselves in a, in a dilemma. The first, the first option which we have is the modeling stuff, right? And we need to develop this further because the model, modeling toolboxes which we have do not answer our uncertainty questions yet. So the, the, but more, re, more research in this field is, is important and needed. And this does not have uh, impacts on real ecosystems and real humans, right? So this is number one. Option number two is then small scale and local experiments in the field of solar radiation management. Okay, but we don't know the impact then on global levels and long term impacts. So this is nice to have, but it does not solve our uncertainty issues. No? And then the third level is uh, global experiments and long scale. No, this would help us to understand the uncertainties, Joe, you talked about, but this was would be a real life global experiment no? with maybe irreversible trends. So we find ourselves in a dilemma situation there. So I'm a scientist, I'm a researcher, I'm in favor of research, you know, but in this case, the researcher third options, op options are in this sense, no, are limited. Thank you. Uh, recognize uh, we're running uh, very short of time, but I just wanted to uh, uh, pick up on the point Dirk had made about the global economic challenges uh, um, we're all facing um, and draw attention to uh, a report uh, and an initiative the OECD is working on called Net Zero Plus. And that is about uh, options we can take for ensuring the resilience of the transition to net zero as well as uh, um, ensuring uh, resilience to the impacts of climate change itself. So on that first point, the resilience of the transition, we're just facing challenge after challenge um, internationally, both, uh, uh, and those challenges have uh, economic consequences that are forcing governments to make very difficult policy choices. What we want to, to emphasize is that we must, because we are so close to crossing those irreversible tipping points um, in, the, in the Earth system, we must prioritize without delay our efforts to reduce emissions urgently. That should be the first port of call when it comes to uh, um, the, the trade-offs amongst government priorities. Thanks. Okay, uh, 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 because uh, the, the, uh, we, the time is up, let me summarize this very quickly. Because our uh, panelists uh, gave us wonderful uh, answers. Uh, because uh, regarding the, how the SR may show to impact our economy and our Earth, um, I think that requires more research because we reduce the uh, solar radiation, it's going to affect our uh, vegetation as well because it's going to cause a food shortage as well. And also we reduce the sunlight and our, of course, it's going to impact our ice sheets as well because uh, some people 
people who are going the, the flow of the uh, ice melt. And also it's going to affect how much uh, water that can be available to humans well. That is going to impact our economies. Additionally, some of these water flow is cross-national. It's going to have the international effect. So I think uh, uh, research in all these areas required a further uh, uh, development, and we need to invest more re efforts in this kind of, in this kind of research, and we need to focus on this topic as well. Uh, additionally, uh, there are more questions that I'm not going to ask you. One of the questions is about uh, the geoengineering. Uh, there's a gap about this kind of research. Can we find other better methods to deal with the climate change? Of course, we hope to find more researchers and to have more innovative programs to help us solve uh, the global problems like this one. Lastly, I want to say thank you to all of our experts to give us a wonderful discussion. And also want to say thank you to all of our audience to focus and uh, pay your attention to this topic. Climate change is a topic and a problem that we all need to deal with globally. Only through a multilateral cooperation, we can deal with this problem. Lastly, I want to say thank you to your participation. We sincerely hope that we can work together to build a better society. And we also to build a zero carbon emission society. I want to say thank you to all of you.